have your Bibles uh, with you, turn with me to the chapter that we read before. We're going to be reading, uh, looking particularly at verses 17 to 20. Romans 16, verses 17 to 20. Let me read those verses again. I urge you, brothers and sisters, to watch out for those who cause divisions and put obstacles in your way that are contrary to the teaching you have learned. Keep away from them. For such people are not serving our Lord Christ, but their own appetites. By smooth talk and flattery, they deceive the minds of naive people. Everyone has heard about your obedience, so I rejoice because of you. But I want you to be wise about what is good and innocent about what is evil. The God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet. The grace of the Lord Jesus be with you. Now, we live in a cultural moment which downplays any kind of definitions of truth. Uh, you know, the kind of thought is, that you have your truth, I have mine. A few years ago on, in the Oxford English Dictionary, the, the word of the year was post-truth. We live in a post-truth time in a post-truth environment people say well there's no such thing as absolute truth there's only relative truth you have truth I have truth they may be contradictory that's okay but any attempt to define the truth then is frowned upon even though of course frowning upon that is an attempt to define the truth so it's ironic and even sometimes God's people are led astray by this thinking so it's important for us to think clearly on this topic about what truth is and how we should pursue it and how it should affect our lives, our lives as individuals, but even more so our lives as a church corporately. John says of the Lord Jesus that he was full of grace and truth, not just one or the other, but he was full of grace and truth. And as followers of Jesus, then we also need to be concerned about grace and about truth. And here in these verses, we read some important commands. Paul gives us two commands for us to obey. I want to, have, I want to give you four points then this evening, and each point has two sub-points. So just to make, make it clear, so we've got four times two, eight points altogether. And the first is this, two commands in verse 17. Two commands in verse 17. Let me read that again. I urge you, brothers and sisters, to watch out for those who cause divisions and put obstacles in your way that are contrary to the teachings you have learned. Keep away from them. Did you see those two commands? Watch out, keep away. Now, at first, at first sight, it looks like there's actually a contradiction between those two. After all, we're being told, watch out for those who cause divisions. And then we're told, avoid them. But it's, so it seems like that we're supposed to divide from people who are dividing. So what's Paul at here? What's he, what is he saying? It's a sad reality, isn't it? That in many churches, those ch the churches are divided over so many issues. It's a scandal, in fact, that God's churches are, invite, uh, are divided. It's no, uh, it's no adver advertisement to the world, is it? If in our church we reflect all the same divisions that are around us in our society. Our society is terribly riven by divisions, is it not? It's not just whether we vote conservative or labor or whatever it might be, but there are divisions right through society. We can't get anybody or everybody to agree on anything at all. How sad then if God's people are not unified in any way, if we also represent all of the same divisions of the society around us. And Paul is really concerned about unity. You remember what he says to the Ephesians, he says, make every effort to keep the unity of the spirit in the bonds of peace. A fractious church then, misrepresents Christ 
and it's a poor advert for the gospel. Is Christ divided? Paul asks the Corinthians. The answer, of course, is no. So therefore, Christ's body should not be divided. And the Bible tells us then that we are united with Christ. So as Christ is not divided, we also should not be divided. So instead, the church should, be, should live in such a way that it speaks volumes to the people around us that something truly spiritual, something truly glorious is happening among us. And that offers hope to a hurting world. How will the world know that we are Christ's disciples? It's not whether we have a fish sticker on the back of our cars or whether we keep a cross on our lapel. Jesus says, by your love, they will know that you are my disciples. And it's not that we all have to be the same, is it? If we all have the same haircut and all wear the same clothes and all wear the same, uh, drive the same cars and all decorate our homes in the same way, that would be creepy, to say the least. But there has to be a unity among us. And so Paul says, watch out for those who create divisions, those who cause divisions, he says. Watch out for them. Now, I've titled this How to Handle False Teaching, but I thought, uh, as I was looking at it again this afternoon, maybe I should have called this How to Handle False Teachers, because that perhaps is more representative of what Paul is saying in these verses. He's saying, watch out. There are people who want to create divisions in the body of Christ. Watch out for them, because it's something that is not wanted by God, and it's a poor advert to the world. So we need to seek the unity of the Spirit in the bonds of peace. So that's the first command. Watch out for those who cause divisions. And the second one, as we saw, is the end of the verse. Keep away from them or avoid them. So two commands, watch out and avoid. So it sounds like a contradiction. Divide from the dividers. Paul is saying these dividers are doing something wrong, then why are we told to avoid people, to keep away from them? That sounds like division, doesn't it? It's because there, is, there are two different kinds of division here that he's talking about. And we can understand it by seeing the phrase that links these two commands together. You see that? I urge you, brothers and sisters, to watch out for those who cause divisions and put obstacles in your way that are contrary to the teachings you have learned. Keep away from them. These divisions then are being caused. These are not divisions on whether you like a particular kind of music or not. These are, these are divisions about teaching, about doctrine, about truth that Paul and the other apostles have been delivering to the saints, have been delivering to the, uh, the disciples of Jesus all throughout the Mediterranean world. And he's saying, people will want to divide you by teaching that which is false, he's saying. Evidently, then, people had come into the church, and it seems that perhaps uh, Paul has only just heard about it. That's why it seems like he's tacking this on at the end of the letter. He's written all this letter and he's just about to send it and then it seems he hears that there are some people who have come into the church to cause divisions and so he wants to add that little bit at the end of the letter. Perhaps that's, that's, that's what he's doing here. Now, what do these people do? They, they cause divisions and put obstacles in your way. Now that word obstacle is a really important obstacle, in the, uh, really important, important word it's something which causes people to stumble. Uh, and it's used, and in particular, about something that causes somebody to leave the path of discipleship and wander off into unbelief so that their faith is shipwrecked. It's a really important thing, he's saying. Watch out for people who put obstacles in your way. These people will shipwreck your spiritual life, he's saying. So false teaching will lead to spiritual death or spiritual shipwreck uh, in, your, in your life. He's saying that there is teaching that does that. 
But there is also teaching that leads to unity and leads to spiritual health. And that's what you need to promote, he's saying. Now, some might say the problem is that people make too much about doctrine. Doctrine causes divisions. And it's true, isn't it, that sometimes we argue over doctrinal matters. And in the past and over church history, that that doctrine, arguing over doctrines, has caused divisions in the church. And I can understand then if somebody would say, well, the problem is because we make too much of doctrine. But that's not what Paul is saying here, is it? He's saying, watch out for those who make too much of doctrine, which is wrong, which is false. Because those people are going to put a stumbling block in your way that will lead to you tripping over and making shipwreck of your faith. So the point is then that, of course, not all doctrines are the same or of the same level. Not all doctrinal points are minor. Some points are minor, aren't they? How many days... 24 hours, was it each day 24 hours in which uh, God created the world? Or were they longer, for example? Or what's the exact uh, uh, program that, w- that Jesus will follow before he comes again? These things uh, we can debate and we can, uh, we can argue about them in love and f- in a friendly way. They shouldn't cause divisions in the church. But when somebody comes and brings a teaching that will cause somebody to trip up in their spiritual life. That's really serious. And that's why Paul, in his first letter to the Corinthians, says that there are certain doctrines that are more important than others. Let me read a few verses from 1 Corinthians 15 to you. He says, Now, brothers and sisters, I want to remind you of the gospel I preached to you, which you received and on which you've taken your stand. By this gospel you're saved if you hold firmly to the word I preached to you. Otherwise, you've believed in vain. For what I received, I passed on to you as of first importance, that Christ died for, your, for our sins, according to the Scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day, according to the Scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas and then to the Twelve. After that, he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers and sisters at the same time, most of whom are still living, though some have fallen asleep, Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles, and last of all, he appeared to me also as to one abnormally born. Paul is saying that there are certain doctrines which are of first importance. And that's what he's talking about here when he's talking to the Romans here. These doctrines, if they're twisted or if they're taught wrongly, will lead to people shipwrecking their faith. These are the ones that we need to be concerned about most of all. He's saying. So it's not that playing up doctrine causes division. It's that not paying attention to the right doctrines causes division. And he wants these people in Rome to grow to maturity, to be able to discern these things that are of first importance so that they can watch out for teachers who come in and want to teach that which is contrary to the truth uh, and cause division. And that's why teaching is really important. And it's why James says this, not many of you should become teachers, my fellow believers, because you know that we who teach will be judged more strictly. It's a big thing. It's a big responsibility to teach the truth. We need to pray for those who are teaching among us. James primarily, of course. Others of us who preach those who lead ladies' Bible study, or Titus 2, those who speak to the children in searches and young people, those who lead home groups, we're all, all of those are involved in some form of teaching. And when you are with your friend and your brother and sister in Christ and you talk about spiritual things, you are, in a sense, being a teacher, being a mentor, being an encourager to one another. And that is an important role that we all need to play in each other's lives. But we need to be careful here, don't we? Which is why we don't give the role of teacher publicly to somebody who is young uh, in the faith. So part of the role of teaching is showing how one thing is different from another, teasing them out so that people can see the truth from error. 
Let me give you an example from church history. Early on in the church, a couple of hundred years after Christ, there was a movement in the wider Greek culture. It was called Gnosticism. And it downplayed the body in favor of the spirit. They said all the, everything that's spiritual is good and the things which are of the body are bad. Uh, and it led to all kinds of problems in the church. And it meant that some church leaders then had to tease out what it really meant for Jesus to be God and man at the same, same time and how that has an impact on the church. And that was really important. It meant that they had to dedicate their whole lives to understanding exactly what the scriptures were teaching on this topic. And that problem of Gnosticism crops up time and again throughout church history. Even just recently, I saw something which seemed to reflect that, that whole teaching again and again. So it's vital to teach the truth and expose false teaching and false teachers. Because if we don't, people get hurt. Believers wander off and end up in a spiritual quagmire. And that splits the church. So truth-based division is necessary to keep truth-based unity. Those who teach false doctrine then need to be isolated. It's like mold. If you find mold in the house, you want to get rid of it because otherwise it'll spread. In the Old Testament times, uh, the people of Israel even given laws on how to deal with mold in the house. And if they find it in the house, they have to cut it out and get rid of it. And the priest has to come and check to see whether it's okay or not. And if it's not, they have to pull the whole house down. That's how important it is. Well, spirit, well false teaching is like mold. And it has to be dealt with by isolating it. And false teachers need to be isolated. And there are two reasons. So this is my second point. We have two commands. And there were two reasons for this. Verse 18. For such people are not serving our Lord Christ, but their own appetites. By smooth talk and flattery, they deceive the minds of naive people. So, two reasons. The first is this, idolatry. These people, are, these people worship idols. You see that? They're serving their own appetites. They're serving their, the belly, literally. Worldly passions are enslaving their minds. And that leads them to teach false teaching. So, so Paul says, watch their life. Do you remember Paul said that to Timothy, he said, watch your life and your doctrine closely. Both are important. And it's important to us, for us to watch the lives of those who are teaching in our fellowship. Because if their lives don't match their teaching, there's something wrong. There was a pastor a couple of decades ago, a leading senior pastor in Britain. Uh, and, and he went really off the rails because his life then went off into all kind of uh, sexual immorality. But it's interesting that people noticed that there was something wrong with him, even not so much in his preaching, it was in his prayer that people noticed that there was something missing. Watch out for teachers in the way they live their lives, and that will come out in the way they pray as, the, as well as the way they teach. So, so these people have worldly passions enslaving their mind. Watch their life. They're always tied together, life and doctrine. So if you believe something false, it will affect your life. But the inverse is also true. If you live a life of duplicity, it will affect your teaching as well. If you live a life that's got some area of your life that's hidden and that you don't want to be other people to see, that's going to affect the way that you teach, says Paul. So that's the first thing. These people, are, they have idols. They're idol worshippers because they do it for their belly's sake. That's their motive, ultimately. And secondly, we need to watch out for them. For us. The second reason is this, because they have smooth talk and flattery. Do you see that? By smooth talk and flattery, they deceive the minds of naive people. Why is it that false teachers 
are never ogres. It's, it's, it's never easy to spot a false teacher, is it? False teachers don't go, away, go around with a mask that, that, that scares people away. False teachers are nice people. They're, they're gentlemen. They're the kind of person that you want to have around the table. They're the life of the party, maybe. They're, they're nice people. You know, one of the biggest, the most important, the most infamous false teachers of the early church was a fellow called Arius. Uh, he believed that Jesus wasn't God, that Jesus was just a man, that God is one, but that God doesn't exist as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Believed that Jesus was just a man. Now, Arius, by all accounts, was a very nice man. And it's, on, it's clear then that, isn't it, a nice person will get a following. He'll get a following. The kind of person you want to have in the pulpit because he's nice. You can bring your neighbors along and they'll like him. But watch out for such people because through their, small, their smooth talk and flattery, they will deceive naive people. So, there we are. It makes it difficult to oppose people, isn't it, if they're nice people, if they're gentlemen, if they're, if they're pleasant people. But we have to do it, says Paul. One person who struggled in this area was Spurgeon in the 19th century. Towards the end of his life, he went through a controversy called the downgrade controversy, in which people started teaching uh, new theories about the Bible and about how we can understand the Bible and whether it's true or not in, in every matter of it. And Spurgeon opposed it. And for that reason, he ended up being somewhat isolated from, the, from other evangelicals in the country because they didn't see things quite as he did. And the reason was this. People thought these are very clever people and very good people who are arguing the case against Spurgeon. Why does Spurgeon have to go around stirring up trouble, they thought. Let's, let's just listen to these people. It, they're, they're very intelligent. They know what they're talking about. But Spurgeon knew. He could see that what they were teaching was wrong. And so he, he opposed them. And for, that, for the sake of that, he was isolated. Martin Lloyd-Jones also experienced something of that as well. For many years, in fact, I don't think he ever spoke at the Keswick Convention because in the days when he was a pastor and preaching, the Keswick Convention had had for many years a teaching uh, on sanctification that Lloyd-Jones rightly, I think, uh, rightly thought this is wrong, the Bible does not teach it, and as long as the Keswick Convention stands for this view on sanctification, on how we grow as uh, followers of Jesus, as long as the Keswick Convention teaches that, I'm not going to be part of it. But of course, Spur people thought that, that Lloyd-Jones was nitpicking, but he wasn't. And thankfully, today, the Keswick Convention doesn't teach that teaching. Lloyd-Jones was able to convince, I think, enough people to realize that actually that's not what the Bible teaches. And so they, they changed their teaching on that. But it wasn't easy for Lloyd-Jones or for his followers, uh, uh, those who, who uh, were his friends, uh, who didn't feel like they could be part of that, that convention for that reason. Okay, so smooth talk and flattery. Secondly, uh, thirdly rather, third point, two cautions. We've looked at two commands and two reasons, and now two cautions. And the first is this, and really it doesn't, it's not explicitly in this passage, but I think it it comes out, and I think we can see, th see that it's taught here. And the first is this, practice restraint. You know, it's possible to go overboard in looking out for false teaching, isn't it? You know, there are people who are heresy hunters. They came in search of false teaching, and they found it wonderfully affirming when they, were di when they discovered it. They, they are the heresy hunters, always looking out for somebody who might be teaching something wrong. And, and they seem delighted when they find some false teaching so that they can expose it uh, and demonstrate how, how amazingly uh, theologically clued up they are. 
John Piper calls such people, they're like sniffer dogs at the airport. You know the sniffer dogs at the airport? They come up to you if they think maybe you've got some drugs in your pocket or something like that. Uh, at, well, they've never come up to me, I must say. <laughs> Perhaps they've come up to you. But anyway, these sniffer dogs, you know, they never go off duty. Even when they're not in the airport. They're, they're, in, they're with their handler and they're at a party. They'll go up to people sniffing around, looking for drugs, looking for explosives. They're never off duty. These heresy hunters are just like sniffer dogs, never off duty. They're always looking to see if somebody might be teaching something that's just slightly wrong so that they can nab them and so that they can expose them uh, and prove how, how wonderfully theologically clued up they are. We need to watch out that we're not like that. We need to be those who, uh, who, who watch out for false teachers, but we mustn't be heresy hunters. Uh, we need to be realistic. We're not all going to agree on everything, even theologically, in our church. And that's, uh, that should be the case like that, because we're all individuals, and we all come from different backgrounds, and we all have different influences on us. We're not all going to agree on everything. Uh, and, and Paul understood this too when writing to the Philippians he tells them this if on some point you think differently that too God will make clear to you he doesn't say if on some point you think differently split from the others he says you know that's okay if you think some things are different from your brother or sister in the congregation you can talk it over uh, and you may have to agree to differ on those points. God will make it clear to you. Don't worry. There are some points of doctrine that we won't all agree on. So, that's the first thing, the first caution. The, second, so the first is caution is practice restraint. The second is this, aim for peace. Avoiding somebody because they're teaching false teaching doesn't mean shunning them. Earlier in the letter to the Romans, Paul tells the believers there to live in harmony with one another. That's something they need to pursue, harmony, unity. And he also says, when somebody curses you, you don't curse them back. You bless them. Do not curse, he says, in Romans chapter 12, verse 14. And he says, if it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. So we may have to rebuke someone or even separate from them, but it doesn't mean that we should be mean to them. Paul confronted, you remember, Paul confronted Peter in Antioch. He says this in his letter to the Galatians. He says, when Peter came to Antioch, he started separating from the Gentile believers when he was having his food. Uh, but Paul opposed him to his face publicly. Because he knew that what Peter and others, including Barnabas, were doing was actually going to have a devastating effect on the church if he didn't expose that publicly. And so he confronts Peter publicly because he says they were not acting in line with the truth of the gospel. So that had to happen. But that doesn't mean he was mean to Peter. He confronted him. He confronted him with his sin. But he wasn't mean. He wasn't unkind. John tells the elder in his second letter to watch out for false teachers who might show up one day at their fellowship gathering. You can see that in John's second letter. He says, don't take them into your house. And by that, he's, he's not saying be mean to them. He's not saying do, don't be kind to them. He's saying if you take them into your house, everybody will think that you're endorsing their message. So if there's some way that you can be kind to them without endorsing that message, then good and fine. Just be aware of the impact that your actions will have on the fellowship when they consider the teaching of these false, teaching, false teachers. We can't pretend there's nothing wrong. We do have to expose false teaching. But we must be able to do that, or we must aim to do that in a peaceful way. So that's two cautions. Practice restraint and aim for peace. Finally, two dimensions, verses 19 and 20. 
Everyone has heard about your obedience, so I rejoice because of you. But I want you to be wise about what is good and innocent about what is evil. The God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet. Two dimensions then. Firstly, we'll do them in reverse order. Firstly, the invisible dimension. Verse 20, the God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet. At first sight, it looks like this verse is completely disconnected to the verses that precede it. But when you think about it, what, it's clear what Paul is doing here. He's saying there is a context in which false teaching happens. And that context is spiritual warfare. We don't live isolated here among ourselves just as human beings. There are spiritual forces, angels and demons. We can't see them, but they exist. They may even be here in this building. Don't ask me how that is. I don't understand it. The Bible doesn't make it clear, but they do exist. And there is a battle going on in the heavenlies, a battle for truth and against truth. And, and Paul is saying here that the God of peace, the God who brings peace, will soon crush Satan under your feet. Why? Because Satan is the father of lies. And it's Satan who is driving these false teachers to teach false, uh, false teaching. So, this is the hidden factor, the invisible dimension in, uh, in this teaching on false, uh, on false teaching. We are in an intense battle with the enemy of our souls, and, this, and Satan is our implacable foe. As Peter says, be alert and of sober mind. Um, your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. In the book of Revelation, he's pictured as a dragon. Who goes into battle with a lion or a dragon? It's the stuff of fantasy, isn't it? And yet, isn't fantasy actually drawing on deep themes of truth, folklore, even Disney films? They reflect a deep theme that is, in fact, truer than we often imagine. That there is this battle in the heavenlies that goes on. That goes on. It is sheer folly to go into battle with such a foe if we're on our own. But wonderfully... Paul says here, we're not on our own. And we're given this, this peek into the spiritual realm in this verse. That there is one who has gone into battle already for us. And he's still in battle with the enemy of our souls. But one day, that man, the God of peace, the God who brings peace to the world, will crush Satan under our feet. That's the invisible dimension, and this is the visible dimension. Verse 19, everyone has heard about your obedience, so I rejoice because of you. But I want you to be wise about what is good and innocent about what is evil. Notice how he will crush Satan. In verse 20, he will crush him under your feet, he says to the Romans. Not under his feet, under your feet. So what's the connection between verse 20 and verse 19? It's surely this, that Satan will be crushed under the feet of believers by their obedience. You see that? Everyone has heard about your obedience, Paul says to the Romans. You've been acting, you've been obeying God through your actions. That will be the way that you crush Satan or that God crushes Satan under your feet so we are ultimately involved in the serpent crushing. Don't you hear echoes of Eden here? Genesis 3, 15, where God curses the evil one and he says that, uh, that there will be enmity between his offspring and the, the offspring of Eve. He, you will strike his heel, but he will crush your head. And that is what Jesus himself, of course, has done already on the cross and will ultimately complete when he comes again. And we are involved in that, Paul is saying. We're involved in that through our obedience. But we need to watch out. Why? 
Well, Paul gives a clue here. The Roman believers were dead keen to follow the Lord. Everyone has heard about your obedience, he says. These were really keen believers. They wanted to do everything that God wants, wanted them to do. They really wanted more of God. They wanted more of spiritual life. They wanted greater spiritual power so that they could be living for God and bringing uh, people to know Christ uh, and having an impact on the society. Is that you? It should be. But Paul is saying, watch out, because that keenness can lead to you being vulnerable. So someone comes along to you and says, how's your spiritual life? How's your prayer life? Don't you want to see more answers to prayer? Don't you want to see more people won to Christ through your witness? Don't you want to live a victorious Christian life? And if you're a spiritual person, you'll be thinking, yeah, I want that. I want more of it. I want more of God. I want more of Jesus. I want more of the filling of the Holy Spirit. But the trick comes in the next step. Because they say this, follow these rules. Use this simple formula. Repeat this short prayer at the beginning of each day. Download this app. Buy this book, watch these videos, Seven Steps to Spirituality, The Higher Spiritual Life, and the list goes on and on and on. And men and women, so many keen believers have been dragged into or pulled into a life of, of a treadmill, seeking to do what they think is, will, will be, enable them to be better believers, better disciples for Jesus, because they're keen. And their keenness leads them to be vulnerable. Which is why we also need to watch out for one another as well. So Paul says, use discernment. But part of that is to dwell on that which is good. Don't go searching out false teaching. Keep your eyes on the truth. Keep your eyes on the gospel. Keep your eyes on the Lord Jesus. That's what he says there. Everyone has heard about your obedience, so I rejoice because of you, but I want you to be wise about what is good and innocent about what is evil. Don't focus on what is false. Focus on the truth. I'm told that bank tellers, will, uh, bank clerks, will, will, you know, they can look through a whole wad of, of bank notes uh, and they'll know as soon as they see one that's false. Why? How, how is it that they're so keen, so able to pick out a false banknote? It's not because they look at false banknotes. It's because they look at the true banknotes. And they're so used to that true banknote, the way it really is, that they can spot it as soon as they see an error, as soon as they see something that's slightly off. And that's what Paul is saying to these believers in Rome. He's saying, you focus on the truth. Focus on what is uh, what is good, he says. Be wise about what is good and innocent about what is evil. Well, let me conclude. Peter says, like newborn babies, crave pure spiritual milk so that by it you may grow up in your salvation. And God willing, next time I preach in a few weeks' time, I'm going to follow this up with with more application. I've hoped to try to lay down some principles here on how to deal with false teaching and false teachers. Uh, and next time, I hope to be able to follow that up by being more specific in, how we, in, in, in what kind of things that may come our way so that we can discern the truth uh, and avoid error. But for now, let me finish with these words. The grace of our Lord Jesus be with you. Amen.